So I'm like a family. It's your brother Landon X, Nation Town TV Live. Happy Savior's Day. And speaking of Savior's Day, we're going to talk about one of my favorite moments from Savior's Day that dealt with, of course, separation. And we're not only going to talk about it, we're going to talk about how it laid out, in my opinion, perfectly, how we can take separation from example to execution. Let's get it. This is, of course, Nation Town TV Live. I'm your brother, Landon X, and we're going to get into the project separation, particularly the plenary session that was uh, one of the workshops of this past Savior's Day. I hope you all enjoyed your Savior's Day weekend. I just got, you know, I just unpacked my bags, you know, just came home from the airport. No, nah, I'm just playing. It was, of course, a virtual session. A virtual Savior's Day, and it went off without a hitch. Shout out to Brother Abdul Kiam and everyone who had a uh, uh, any type of uh, involvement in the production and overall execution of this past Savior's Day. But what we're going to talk about is separation, but separation in the sense of a blueprint and a separation as far as execution. But first, let me start off in the proper fashion. 
in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah who appeared to us in the person of Master W. Fard Muhammad, to whom praises are due forever. And I further bear witness that his exalted Christ is none other than the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And these two hands came together to shape and mold a divine leader, teacher, guide, and criterion in our midst. I'm speaking of none other than the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who we also got to hear from on several different occasions this past weekend. And in those three great names, I greet the Nation Town family in the words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language of Assalamu alaikum. Again, shout out to everybody chiming in. I see you. Uh, hit us up with your questions and comments. We don't intend to be long, but we do intend to be strong. I see you, Brother Freddie. Uh, peace and blessings to you, dear brother. Brother Hakeem, wa alaikum salam. And also, Brother Nathaniel, all praises due to Allah, wa alaikum salam. Well, listen, family. If you were watching and following our Savior's Day events, Savior's Day operated almost identical to how it normally does. The only difference is it was largely a virtual event because of, of course, the pestilence that has plagued the nation, plagued America, I should say. But we didn't miss a beat. We continue with our workshops. And since nobody had to hold post <laughs> this year, it was really a joy being able to experience all of these workshops on demand. And the workshop that really, of course, of course, was of great value to the Nation Town family was, of course, Sister Dr. Ava's uh, Project Separation Plenary Session. Plenary meaning a summit where we not only sit around and, and talk about what we want to do, what we could do, what we should do. We got into the details of what is being done. And man, it was mind blowing. It was beautiful. And I, and I wanted to get a little more into it. I'm going to show you some snippets from it. That's very important. And we also are going to deal with how we can go from the examples that were given to us and go from graduate from example to execution, because they basically highlighted some brothers and sisters who are giving that example, who's going out there and doing it and getting it done. And we got to go from example to execution. Again, shout out to everybody chiming in. Hit us up with your questions and comments. This is, of course, Nation Town TV Live brought to you by NationTownStore.com. That's a big part of separation right there. Doing for self, but also supporting your own. Getting the same products that you would always have to buy. You know, especially if you live in a civilized life. You got to wash your backside, right? You need deodorant, right? You need body oil, right? You need paper towels, right? And of course, every now and then you need a bean pie. Let's keep it real. I'm not the only bean pie addict on this earth, but support your own because that's the lifeblood. That's the lifeblood of white supremacy. It's consumerism. Did you know that? It's not about just starting a business. But when that business is started by that brother and sister, do you support it? We're going to talk about that a little bit. It's also brought to you by doforself.net, of course. And I've been promising a major update and we will get there. We absolutely will. Word is bond. And of course, to those of you who want to support the Nation Town movement, feel free to hit us up on Cash App, dollar sign, Nation Town. Dollar sign, Nation Town. And of course, 10% of the proceeds that come from our Cash App donations do go directly to our Yes Ma'am program, which stands for a meal and a message, where we provide healthy meals to those in need here in the Los Angeles area. And if it be the will of Allah, we will continue to expand this to other areas in Southern California, as well as America as a whole. And with that said, family, let's get right into it because I don't intend to be long, but I do intend to be strong. Let's look at an introduction, the introduction of this plenary session because it was powerful. And I really feel like for those who didn't see it, I want you to feel free to go on YouTube, go to Abdul Kiyam. Some of you may not, some of you that are familiar with the nation 
uh, sympathizers or maybe you're not active or whatever the case may be, that name may not ring a bell, Abdul Kiyam. But for those who it does not ring a bell, you may remember the name Brother Jesse and the Twitter army. Well, Brother Jesse was granted a beautiful holy name from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and their name is Abdul Kiyam. He's got a YouTube page. Look it up, uh, and you'll see that AM logo uh, down in the corner. But uh, go to his page, and he has, to my understanding, to my knowledge, if I'm not mistaken, he has all of the workshops set up on his page, and I believe he was a major component in making sure that everything went off without a hitch uh, this past uh, uh, Savior's Day weekend. So major shout out to our brother, Brother Abdul Kiyam Muhammad out of uh, Moss Number 45, Houston, Texas. And uh, let's take a look at this intro to the plenary session for Project Separation. Again, this was not a summit where a bunch of Negroes, <laughs> in fact, there was not a Negro in the room, nothing but black gods, but it wasn't Negroes sitting around the room talking French, as I call it. You know, when we when we when we get to, you know, talking about the things that we absolutely must do, we get real French. We start saying we 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 need we need we need. Now there are things that we need to do, but what I loved about this session is that they got into the meat of it, and they also provided examples of individual believers, individual believing families. They were not sitting on waiting on a boat to jump on. They were building their own ark by the instructions of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan. Let's take a look. See how the white man did us, dog. They, they let them go and they gonna keep killing us. It ain't gonna never stop, man. I will read this to you. We want our people in America whose parents or grandparents were descendants from slaves to be allowed to establish a separate state or territory of their own either on this continent or elsewhere. We believe that our former slave masters are obligated to provide such land and that the area must be fertile and minerally rich. We believe that our former slave masters are obligated to maintain and supply our needs in this separate territory for the next 20 to 25 years until we are able to produce and supply our own needs. Since we cannot get along with them in peace and equality, after giving them 400 years of our sweat and blood and receiving in return some of the worst treatment human beings have ever experienced, we believe our contributions to this land and the suffering forced upon us by white America justifies our demand for our complete separation in a state or territory of our own. Now the honorable all praise is due to Allah. The honorable Elijah Muhammad. All praise is due to Allah, wonderful introduction. And then from there, our beloved sister, Dr. Ava Muhammad went forward with the program. For those that don't know, she went on a, uh, before, the uh, COVID-19 uh, 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 pandemic, she went on a nationwide tour where she was surveying our people, not just the Muslims, but the people for their desire to actually separate. And it was a beautiful, 
um, um, tour she went on. She had a wonderful and successful stop here in Los Angeles. Now, I know some of y'all watching probably thinking to yourself, man, man, Nation Town always talking about separation. Separation this. Economics that. Separation this. Support black-owned business that. Well, here's my question. Why aren't you? Why is this not the number one topic whenever two Aboriginal people come together and talk? I don't care what's going on in the sports world. I don't care what's going on with celebrities. I don't care what's going on with anything that's going on in the world. If you're a sports fan, cool. Talk about the Super Bowl. Talk about LeBron. Then talk about separation. You know, if you're a celebrity worshiper, that's fine. Talk about Beyonce. Talk about Kanye. Then talk about separation. If you are a self-loving and self-respecting Aboriginal person, separation should always be a part of your agenda. Now, let's keep a couple of things in mind. First of all, Nation Town TV will never stop talking about separation. I don't care if one of you are watching or a million of you are watching for the simple fact that you see that, that logo at the top right-hand corner of your screen. Not only is that the national of the nation of Islam, the sun, moon, and stars, but the term itself, Nation Town, which was coined by our beloved Western Regional Student Minister, Abdul Malik Saeed Muhammad, formerly known as Tony Muhammad. The whole concept of that is the two major functions of any municipality, any nation, or any town, and that it always has a communication platform or hub or modes of communication, and it always has an economy. You go to any city, whether it's a small town in the middle of the sticks in Mississippi or Los Angeles or New York, you're going to find communication hubs, television networks, newspapers, and then there's an economy that undergirds that community. That's the only reason people live there. You're going to have a hard time getting millions of people to live in one area if there is no economy. There's no jobs that they can go and get. There's no way for them to even sell products or goods to anybody because nobody else is there. You understand? So that's what Nation Town is about. Nation Town is not about Brother Landon. However, Brother Landon does not believe in sitting around waiting on a million Muslims to come and help Brother Landon do anything. And neither should you as an Aboriginal man or woman. You shouldn't just sit around saying, you know what? When, when an army of people get behind me, then I'll separate. When an army of people get behind me, then I'll do what's right. When an army of people get behind me, that's what I'm going to do. See, there's a reason why, dear family. Shout out to everybody chiming in. I see you. Make sure you share this message. Share this message. Hit that share button. Hit that like button. Hit that red face mad button. If you're mad, it's all right. Show us some kind of emotion. Show us how you feel, but shout out to everybody chiming in. I see you, big brother Tevis. All praises due to Allah, sister Latanya. All praises due to Allah. But let's 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 deal with something. There's a reason why the word unity starts with you and not a why. I, I, I'm gonna say that again. There's a reason why the word unity starts with you and not a why. Because that's what I hear most of the time when it comes to unity. Why can't we, we unite? Why don't we have this kind of business, that kind of business? Why, why, why? That's because unity starts with you. And we're going to talk about three major steps that anybody and everybody can make immediately, starting right now, to do your part toward separation and the Aboriginal have family having their own and not relying on the same person that we all agree is our oppressor. Now, you know, we, we, we want to talk to the whole, not just to the few. So if you are one of those Negroes, whether you be a black Negro, a Hispanic Negro, an Asian Negro, Native American Negro, you know, they make Negroes in all shapes and sizes, please believe. But if you're a Negro, and you feel like the, the Caucasian in his world is not oppressive to you, all praise is due to Allah. You properly relieved. You can go ahead and click that, that X on your screen and, and move on. But if you understand that we are under an oppressive state, we are in an oppressive system. Well, that system has a, 
a person that operates and created that system, just like a web, a spider web has a spider. You understand? So that's what separation is for. It's about getting away from not just the web, but the spider himself, but getting away from him completely, not just geographically. We're already separated from the white man geographically. The majority of Aboriginal people live in communities where the people in that community look just like them. Our Native American brothers are on uh, reservations with people that look like them. The majority of our Hispanic brothers and sisters are in what they call the barrio with people that look just like them. Black people, we in what we call the hood, the ghetto, with people that look just like us. So it's not about just geographical separation. That's not enough. The question is, where is your mind and where is your money? That's the question. But like I said, the word unity starts with you. And what I loved about this plenary session dealing with separation is that Sister Ava and our, and our beloved brothers and sisters at headquarters in Chicago, they put together a nearly flawless, a very near perfect <laughs> uh, workshop because of the fact that it covered every aspect of separation and gave so many different examples. Because one thing we get bogged down on as black people when we know a change is necessary, like our lessons say, cannot a fool see that a mighty change is coming? But even if we agree that there's a mighty change that's, that's, that's in effect, we'll get bogged down with arguing over which way to go first. So the beauty of this plenary session is that Sister Ava and company, they all went over several different aspects, and these were believers Aboriginal believers who took it upon themselves to take that first step themselves. And we're going to talk about in a minute how, 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 how common that is in the history and the teachings of the, of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But let's deal with this. First and foremost, I know, as we've covered it here, that the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and what I call the Black Man's Bible he famously said in Message to the Black Man that six to eight Muslims should come together with knowledge of a particular business. The example that he used was a grocery store. He says six to eight Muslims should come together with knowledge of running a grocery store. What kind of knowledge? Meaning they already own the grocery store? No. Do you realize that if you work somewhere every day, whether you like it or not, whether you enjoy that job or not, after a few months, you're becoming an expert of that particular business. If you worked uh, at a grocery store for four years when you were in school, now you probably made the mistake of showing up to work every day and just counting hours, looking at the clock, waiting for your clock out time. But if you were intelligent, you would have paid attention to the ins and outs and the way they operated because you were getting a paid education because that was in a successful enough business to hire you off the street, sight unseen, especially if you're black. Remember, we're the last hired and first five. They really don't want to hire you anyway. So when they hire you, that proves you're working for a successful company that had to hire you in order to continue operating and making a profit. And if they weren't making a profit, they wouldn't have hired you at all. So we all have knowledge since we're all blue collar workers and we all are out here looking for jobs and have had jobs. We're all experts on a lot of different fields, whether you own the company, you don't got to own the McDonald's. Hell, you know more about running that McDonald's than the owner. If you worked at McDonald's, the owner ain't showing up there every day. He didn't have to prove to the McDonald's corporation that he was an expert in hamburgers before he started uh, as a as a as a as a owner uh, of a franchise, that's not what they care about. They just made sure that his money was right. As long as his or her money was right, then they allowed him to go into that business. So if you worked at the, at his McDonald's for four years, by the time you left, you knew more about the ins and outs of running that than the owner himself. Now, I say that to say this: I know that the messenger told us to go after six to eight, but don't use that as a crutch to not do anything. Some of us get stuck on that. 
And I really think it's a form of deceptive intelligence. Oh, yeah, I'll do this and do that when seven or eight believers come. Listen, it's seven to eight believers with knowledge. I hear other people say it's, he said six to eight like minded. Like minded. But that's what knowledge means. If you have knowledge of the same things, that means that you're like minded. So if you want to find like-minded people, then they have to be like-minded, meaning that they have the same enthusiasm and zeal about that endeavor as you do. What if you can't find that six to eight? What you going to do? You just going to sit on your shoulders and your elbows and say, man, and, and post on Facebook all day about, man, why can't we unite? Why can't we do? Why can't we give it? Yeah, that's a good way to continue being uh, what, how the brother, he said, being a, uh, <laughs> he, he said, an idolizer. Now, when you hear that word, you think he's talking about idolatry or worshiping idols, but he meant idol, I-D-L-E, meaning somebody who just does nothing. You just sit in idol, in an idol state. And that's what a lot of us want to sit in. So with deceptive intelligence, we say, well, I don't have a million people helping me, so uh, you know, I'm just going to sit around and complain. Well, here's the problem with that. Y'all know how we do it on Nation Town TV. We like to bust up uh, hypocrisy and contradictions. Another major problem in our community is our <laughs> inability to live wholesome lives. I mean, we have the ability, but one of the things that scares black people from the Nation of Islam and any organized construct is the discipline. Why? We have something in the nation of Islam called the restrictive law, 16 restrictive laws to be exact. And all of those 16 restrictive laws are anti-Negro policies that makes it impossible for you to continue the life of a Negro. And that's difficult for us because a lot of us want to smoke, want to drink, want to eat nine meals a day, want to eat hot Cheetos at noon. Want to do this, want to do that, want to fornicate. Now, here's my thing. This is how I know that the that excuse of, you know what, I'll do something when six to 8,000 people get behind me. I know that that's a lie. The lie detector test determined that's a lie because you don't need all that support when you break the restrictive law. You don't need no help to fornicate. You don't need six to eight homeboys to get behind you and say, brother, you need to go holler at her. And sister, you don't need six to eight homegirls to tell you, girl, he show is cute. Go holler at him. Give him your number. You don't need six to eight people to get you to go to the liquor store. You don't need six to eight people to get with you. If you remember that song, I Got Five on it. Remember, one of the lyrics on the song, it said, you ain't getting high off me for free. So it, <laughs> that proves that his intention was to go and get that, that bag of weed regardless. But if you want to put something on it, and if you want to partake in it, then by all means, please do. But either way, homeboy was going to get that bag. Do you understand? To get that sack. So when it comes to things, doing the things we're not supposed to do, we never need no motivation. We don't need a team. We don't need support. We don't need any of that. We don't need a leader. We don't need nobody to guide us there. Oh, we get very industrious when it's time to get high. When it's time to eat something we ain't supposed to be eating, when it's time to do something we know is bad for us, we get so industrious and independent. I mean, we become, <laughs> we turn into the Bill Gates of the liquor store. We turn into the Jay-Z uh, <laughs> going to the weed man. It's like everything that we want by some desire, whether it's good for us or not, that desire feeds our will. So let's stop leaning on that excuse that, you know what, we don't have nothing because I can't find five or six people. Who did it. No, stop that. Stop that. Because when you get a taste for a burger, you don't, you don't run a survey of, of six to eight other believers. You don't call six to eight believers and say, hey, I'm getting a craving for a pork chop. What y'all think? Nah, you just go ahead. You put on the disguise and you go get that pork chop. And when you see a believer, you run in your car real quick. Nah, I'm just playing. But we don't need any support, any help when we're doing something that we desire, whether it's good or bad. So let's stop leaning on that. And to those of you that are sympathetic to the teachers of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad in our history, and especially to those that are believers, 
I have to give you the, the best example, which is the example of those that we say we follow. Starting with this man right here. Let me make sure I roll my R's. Master Fard Muhammad. By the way, just, 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 just for the record, I want y'all to all go back to all the previous ex episodes of Nation Town TV and confirm the fact that your brother Landon has always rolled his R's on Master Far Muhammad. That's an inside joke for those that watched the, uh, the keynote address yesterday. But anyway, Master Far Muhammad, as we know in the Nation of Islam, he came 9,000 miles with who? Everybody in the comments section, I want y'all to answer that. Who did Master Far Muhammad come 9,000 miles with? Who did he come with? Y'all let me know. Who did he come with? Did he, did he have a sidekick? Did he have a homeboy? Did he have a road dog? Who did he come with? He came 9,000 miles by himself. I mean, he didn't have a dog with him or nothing. Nobody was riding shotgun with Master Fahad Muhammad. And when he got here, he went door to door. He was coming in and out of the country for about 20 years. But when he found what he was looking for, he went door to door. In the ghetto, Black Bottom, I mean, that just sounds like the ghetto. Come on now, Black Bottom, Detroit, door to door by himself, even got stole on. He didn't care. He knew what he was there for. He knew what he was doing. And what that creates is a synergy that's likened to an actual atom. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But then you had the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Something interesting happened to, mass, to the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad in 1934. Before Master Far Muhammad departed, where did he go? He went wherever he felt like going, but he was no longer in the midst of the believers. But when he departed, he went before the believers in Detroit, and he gave them the option to pick the next leader or the person that would sit in his stead after he left and they all had their opinions of who they think. Some of them picked the most articulate believers. Some of them picked just their homeboys. Some of them probably, I'm sure some of them picked themselves. Some of them said me, 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 me. And then he listened to all of them, you know, throw their hats in the ring and who they think should be the one to, to sit in his seat while he left. And after he heard all of that, he said, here, Kareem. The original holy name of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad was Elijah Kareem. Now, that didn't sit well with the thousands of believers that Master Far Muhammad had gathered after coming by himself. In fact, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad's biological brother, a brother named Kalat, he felt some kind of way in such a major way that he made a promise to himself and everybody in the mosque that he would eat one grain of rice per day until he found the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and murdered him. This was his biological brother. See, this is what happens when we get so wrapped up in personality worship and start having sick ideas of ourselves. He was so wrapped up in just the leadership that he was willing to kill his own brother. So the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, he got, he got out of Dodge, as they say. He got the hell out of Dodge. But he, he, he left with a purpose. He wasn't just running for his life. He had a purpose because he left Detroit and went up and down the East Coast for several years. And everywhere that he stopped, he set up a study cell or a study circle, which are now mosques and later temples. So he set that up and he was doing it with who? Who was running with him besides God himself? He was by himself. He didn't sit around and say, well, you know, when 25,000 believers get behind me, then I'll go set up uh, temples on, on the East Coast. Then I'll go do this. Then I'll go that. No, no. He knew what needed to be done, and he had a job to do. He was commissioned by Master Father Muhammad to do what he did. Furthermore, we can go to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. For those of you that know the Nation of Islam, for all intents and purposes, came to an end in 1975. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan himself had a lapse of faith. But in 1977, he stood up on what his spiritual father taught him, 
and made a conscious decision that he would rebuild the work of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But when he made that conscious decision, he didn't have thousands of believers behind him like you see him now. In fact, he had death threats. He had people telling him that if he even tried, then he better watch his back. In fact, the only allies that he had early in the game was Bernard Kushmir, who we now know as Jabril Muhammad, and a couple of other brothers later on in the process. But what Master Far Muhammad did, what the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad did, what the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan did, they produced a very scientific force, two very important scientific forces, centripetal and centrifugal force that's pushing and pulling, something that pushes away and, and pulls in. That's what every atom in your body is doing. All Every billion or trillion of them that's in your body right now, it follows the law of centripetal and centrifugal force. And what that does is that causes an atmospheric circulation that pulls other matter toward it. And anything that it can't use, it, it, it pushes it away. But that's just like working. That's what the pistons in your car are doing when you turn on the ignition. It, those pistons are firing, centripetal, centrifugal force. It's spinning, it's working, it's working, it's working. So the key and the point I'm trying to make is you got to get to work. On whatever it is that you want to see in a reality, you got to get to work and then the help will come. Trust me, the help will come. I bear witness in anything that you do that's right, the help will come. So we got to come out of that mentality that we got to sit around and wait on the army. Ain't nobody going to follow you and you ain't going nowhere. Come on, man. Just in the ideas. Ideas are like, <laughs> and I don't mean to be vulgar, but the Holy Quran talks about worthless water, seminal fluid. Uh, okay, let me, let me just be uh, straight up with it. Sperm. It's called worthless water in the Holy Quran because it's worthless unless it collides with the ovum of a woman. And that's what ideas are. Ideas are just worthless water. Can't nobody do nothing with an idea. And who are you to think that all you got to do is do an alley-oop with an idea and somebody just going to jump up and dunk it? You know, you, you're not Chris Paul. You ain't Russell Westbrook. You ain't you don't play point guard for nobody. Stop thinking you can just throw something in the air and people are gonna jump up and get it. Stop it. Stop it. In fact, somebody might jump up and get it. It's gonna be somebody who will take it and do something with it instead of just talking about it. But I just had to get that off my chest because I see that a lot from very intelligent black people in and outside of the nation of Islam. Shout out to everybody chiming in. I see you, Brother Todd Hinton. He says, Master Fard Muhammad, let the R roll off your tongue when pronouncing his name. He came 9,000 miles by himself and raised up an army when he got here. And he did it with centripetal and centrifugal force. All praises due to Allah. I see you, Brother Timothy. He said, by himself. Sister Latanya said, alone. Brother Drew said, alone. That's right. That's right. That's how we come into the world. Alone. And like I said, that's how we attack all of our desires. The things we really desire, we go after it by ourselves. Y'all didn't all took that late night trip to the store to go get some ice cream, something that you know, you just know you don't need. You know your waistline don't need it. You know your, you know your, <laughs> you, you know your blood sugar level don't need it, but you just had to go get that taste. You had to go get it. And you didn't do a survey. Like I said, you didn't do a survey before you did because you know what the survey would have said. If you would have called up your brother in the ranks or just called up somebody, somebody that you know wants the best for you, they would have told you, no, nah, just stay home. Just go to sleep. You know, get your, get your drink of water and just call it a day. You don't need that. But we always go after it. That's the point that I'm saying. You got to do that with everything if... It truly is a desire. And if it's not that big of a desire, then stop talking about it anyway. Because even if you if it if it's not a desire, even if you got that army of thousands, you would waste it. Because it's not truly a desire. Because your first day at work on that desire, you would give up because the next obstacle you would have is trying to lead those thousands of Negroes. And trust me. 
And trust the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan when he tells you that that is one of the hardest jobs. In fact, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad said it's harder than the creation of the sun, moon, and stars. Now, let's get into the plenary session. Before we get up out of here, shout out to everybody chiming in. Hit us up with your questions and comments. Make sure you hit us up. Uh, uh, make sure you uh, share this message. Get it out there. Hit us up on Dollar Sign Nation Town on Cash App. Show us some love. All praises due to Allah. I want you to hear what my favorite, I guess you can call it testimony, was on this plenary session. It was from a brother by the name of Abdul Akbar. And man... I, I had a flashback to my Christian church days when this brother was presenting what he's doing. It wasn't about his oratory skills. It was about the the approach that he made. See, his approach was 100% about urban development. When the minister said, make your own communities a decent place to live, that was a double-edged sword. Double, and that speaks for itself in the most common and 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 in direct meaning of that is exactly what it says make your own communities where you live now a decent place to live it also means make your own communities go somewhere find land that's available and create your own communities from scratch but the minister also said that america's for sale rebuild the wasted cities that's in the scripture that not only came out the mouth of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, but that's in your scripture. That's in the poison book. That's in the Bible. Rebuild the wasted cities. And this brother did that. And I want y'all to take a look at what our brother did. This is Abdul Akbar of Chicago. We bought the shopping mall on 71st and Yates, right across the street from the Culture Center. Well, we have businesses that we're doing business there and we're doing business for our own community. We put a contract in on directly across the street, 7,400 South Stony Island, where we attempt to be able to build a NUA house, NUA, a NOI house, or an embassy house for people. They're telling me that I gotta stop talking. I'm sorry, I know I could be long-winded. I have so much more that I wanted to share with you. Thank you for the giving me this opportunity to share with you some of the work, things that I've been working on. Assalamu alaikum. This project has been a desire of mine for the last two to three years. Uh, we initially started doing business in this community four years ago uh, with a coin laundry facility. And I thought that perhaps other individuals would come to create economic development within this Woodlawn community, but it never happened. Okay. And my vision was to take over and redevelop the entire block. Since the Koreans weren't trying to do it, the Arabs weren't trying to do it, and obviously we as a people weren't trying to do it. So our aim is to take this section here from 625 all the way to the next end of the city block, which would be St. Lawrence. This corner would be something dealing with economics. The second business will be dealing with food, because it's dealing with the food desert. The section that's right next to us over here will be dealing with training for entrepreneurship. Because, I mean, we've got enough job training facilities, but how many entrepreneurs have we produced that would be the ones who would create jobs in the various communities? That's what our aim and goal is. And the last section over there will be dealing with uh, health and wellness, uh, medical uh, facility. Uh, that other section there. And on the corner lot is where we're going to be putting the uh, community garden for producing vegetables, fresh vegetables, and we we'll call it an urban, urban, uh, urban garden. So, how much space is this? This will be. This is two city lots. We have food deserts uh, throughout the city of Chicago. And the aim and purpose is to be able to demonstrate uh, to the community that farming and gardening and doing for self connects us to the earth. It connects us to nature. And that's something that's really missing within uh, the urban corridor. So our aim and purpose is to develop this section here for uh, farm and garden. Uh, and then, as I indicated, take over the entire city block.
praises due to a lot of his brother Abdul Akbar, as you can see. This was a community that he was very familiar with. I believe he grew up in that community. Uh, he also gave us a little bit about his biography. The brother said that he got into a little bit of uh, legal trouble, as many <laughs> Aboriginal brothers and sisters can attest to. And he made a promise to himself after coming into the teachings in the belly of the beast that he would come out and be a productive citizen. So we're not looking at brothers and sisters we, we're not looking at silver spoon babies. We're not looking at brothers and sisters who had everything laid out for them. They had a desire, like my brother uh, Nathaniel put in the comments, desire feeds and fuels the will. And so they set themselves in heaven at once. And heaven ain't a place to kick back and put your feet up. No, take that old Negro plantation church mentality on somewhere. Heaven is something, it's, first of all, it's a condition of life here on earth, not after you die. But it's a place to work and to build. And our brother did that. So hats off to my brother. I mean, that, that touched me because that's exactly what the aim and purpose is of Nation Town TV. My wife just closed on property in Austin. I intend to buy property in my own hometown where Black Wall Street used to be, Tulsa, Oklahoma. We're already putting the pieces together. We're already self-employed, already doing for self. 80% of the products in our home are black owned, actually 70% of nation produced and distributed products, about 80 to 90% are black owned. And it's not that hard. It really is not that hard. Just keep, in, keep watching Nation Town TV. We'll lay it out for you. So you can start that part of uh, that aspect of separation. But shout out to my brother. That was a beautiful part. Now we're going to go to another end of separation. Remember, it's a double-edged sword making our own communities a decent place to live. There's also the possibility of building your own community. You see black people doing this. For example, there was a group of black people who bought uh, a plot of land in Georgia. And you saw a lot of memes and stuff. And, and that's beautiful. That's beautiful when you see a meme that's telling you. But don't just go off your timeline. Don't think something is not happening unless it's on your timeline. Get out of that mentality. A lot of us don't know anything unless it's on our timeline. Quit that. Quit that. You know, ask around. But in the Nation of Islam, I personally know of a minimum, a minimum of three groups of believers in three different parts of America that are actually actively building their own communities in rural parts of the country. And we're going to talk about one in a moment. And of course, one is one that my family is invested in in Austin. But when we get to that point, let's say you go and buy 40 acres, 100 acres, 1,000 acres, 10,000 acres somewhere. And don't, don't, don't limit yourself. There was a brother who, who limited himself that was on this program who thought he just wanted one acre and ended up with 20 plus for the same price that he was ready to pay for one acre. See, Allah will back us when we have the right desires to feed the right will. But when we decide that we're gonna go that route, if you really wanna make your own and build your own, what you gonna do, go hire some white people to build it for you? You gotta know how to build it. Now, how many black folks work in construction? Lots. It goes back to what I said at the beginning of this program. Pay attention to your day job. One of the worst mistakes that black people make is that when we are working a job for the white man or for whoever, and we don't like that job, we just kind of blank out and just do the bare minimum. Don't pay no attention. We daydreaming all day on the clock. And then when it's time to clock out, we get the hell up out of there like Fred Flintstone. Stop that. Y'all don't remember Fred, Fred Flintstone. But anyway, stop that. You are working for a successful company. You're getting paid to sit in the middle of an operational successful company. Take notes. Hell, write it down. That'll make shit. You might mess around and get a promotion. Somebody going to come to you and say, brother, why are you writing all this down? Wow, he's really committed to this job. No, he ain't. <laughs> But it'll make you look good. So while you're there, you'll make the most amount of money you'll make. But at the same time, you're paying attention to how the company operates. Well, you say, well, I work at a chicken restaurant and, and, and I don't want to own no chicken restaurant. Business is business. 
That's why I wish more of our brothers and sisters who are in the street life with the illegal trades. I wish they would, you know, clean up their money because business is business. In fact, a lot of our brothers in the streets will find out the legitimate business is actually a lot easier because you ain't got to worry about nobody killing you. <laughs> you feel me? So pay attention to those who are working a day job, who are working for somebody else. I'm, I kind of disagree with Dame Dash on that whole thing about being an employee. At some point, you got to be an employee. You got to follow at some point before you lead. If you go straight to lead, and I guarantee you, you're not a good leader. I respect Dame Dash. I got a lot of love for him. The minister loves him. He loves the minister. But I disagree with him on that. And I'm speaking from experience. I have not clocked in for anybody in a decade. But it's because when I was clocking in for somebody, I was paying attention to how they operate. Pay attention to how they operate. But let's go back to how are we going to build these, these, these villages when we get to that point. If you go that route. Well, this brother that I'm going to bring up now, this brother's name is Louis Ali. And you're going to love this. You're going to love this. Watch what he has to say about the actual process of building and why it's important. We have to give our young people something to do. And it's our job as men to teach these ill trades to our children. So my, my youngest son is eight years old. And I'm not tech savvy, but I'm, I'm gonna try my best to give you an idea of what he's doing today. All right. So this is this is some of this land in Louisiana. That's our operator. He's on the dozer, but on the compactor is my eight-year-old boy. He's gonna work all day today with me. I'm gonna coach him the same way you coach a basketball or a football player, and he's really good right now. They're gonna, he's gonna get us to pass these compaction tests. And uh, most of the uh, people in my family, this trade has been around in my family for years. We do infrastructure work. We're very proud of what we do. Our motto is BE, or black excellence. We don't believe that black people should be sitting around begging Caucasians or others to develop their community or to do anything for them. We don't believe in idleness. We don't believe in wasting time. We believe that you should get these little boys and train them really, really fast. At night, the same way Harriet Tugman or Frederick Douglass, these people overcame great obstacles. They had to learn how to read. Well, why not teach our little boys how to read plans? The plans on a construction site are almost like a Bible or Holy Quran. You repetitiously read the plans and you look at them. Anything that are on those plans is what you're supposed to be doing. And we repetitiously do it over and over again. Let, let, let me, let's go talk to Zayad. Hey, Zayad, you enjoying yourself? What you gonna do, man? How old are you? I'm eight. All right, you heard from him. He's eight years old. He wants to build a new world. Listen, I can tell you, there's plenty of work in our community to do. Just imagine all of those broken down houses, broken down families. We rebuild the families by rebuilding the culture. You don't need a church or a mosque. What you need is a dinner table where you invite people over to start really thinking and talking about what's happening with our families. The men in our community are just too idle. The same way you can go out and teach a young man how to play basketball, play football, jack, jack people, become a gangbanger. We don't need to do any of that. Why don't we teach them skill trades? You know, we can do it. We've done it before. In Louisiana, we had some of the best black skill tradesmen ever. Integration, unfortunately, destroyed a lot of the black business infrastructure. And so we have to rebuild it. This summer, I'm planning on getting more little boys 
8 to 14 years old. We'll take 8 or, eight or 10 of them. And we intend to train them. My specialty area is infrastructure area, but I have brother, brothers in electricity. I have brothers who are civil engineers. I have brothers who are architects. I have brothers who are great plumbers. I have brothers who are great truck drivers. I have brothers who are in the steel trades. And there's so much work to be done in the black community. Can you imagine how much the world would respect us if we got really serious about building? We don't want to debate about religion because your religion is what you practice. If you treat people right and respect yourself, not just black people will begin to respect us, but a significant amount of Caucasians will respect us. But it's important for us to earn our respect. We need to really work hard. If you're gonna hang around with rappers and these kind of people, they are our people, then we gotta get busy building something. If you're gonna be with football players, then why not tell the football players to link up with the black contractors and begin to build something for our community? So I ain't come to preach or talk. I'm just so thankful that a black woman would put me out in the future so that I could have some children to train. And really, our children are our greatest possession next to God himself. We really need to do everything we can do to take responsibility for our children and our women and try to make a better world for them. All praises due to our lot. Eight years old, moving heavy duty construction equipment. I ain't even going to talk about what I was doing when I was eight years old. <laughs> this brother... That's what I'm talking about. Train them up as they should go. And that also brought something else to mind. Keep in mind, family, not only is our open enemy going out the door. I mean, scientifically, this ain't Muslim dogma. The man that you love so much, the Caucasian, he's going out the door. In fact, he has what they call a negative birth rate, meaning that there are more of them dying than being born. Even though they have the best health care that money can buy, they run the health care system. Even though they have more money than anybody, they have more luxuries than anybody. More of them are dying than being born. But not only that, the time is coming very soon where they're going to tap out. Just <laughs> when I, I mean what it sounds like when I say they're going to tap out from running this country. They're going to just give up. They're going to get up and give up one day. Or they're going to make so many mistakes that you're going to wake up one day and they've left it all to you. They're just going to say, you know what, forget it. We're tired of this. And we got a glimpse of it these past couple of weeks in the great state of Texas, where after an unexpected cold storm and snowstorm and ice storm, the electrical grids failed. It was all over the news. Like, as you see here, it says a Texas grid failure while more heads need to roll. They're ready to fire people and kick people out of office based on it. And then check this out. This is a Houston news station. They said that the state of Texas was four minutes and 37 seconds away from complete grid failure, which means that they would have had a, a, a blackout, no electricity, for weeks, four minutes and 37 seconds, because here's the thing, Texas, which has been talking about seceding from America for years, because it's a heavily Caucasian and heavily uh, Republican and conservative state. And, you know, they claim states rights and that kind of thing. That's really just a cold word for, for not liking Negroes. But they want to secede from America for tax purposes, but they've already seceded their electrical grid. They have their own electrical grid, and it's a very poorly run electrical grid, despite the fact that they're working with billions of dollars. So it ain't a money thing. It's just a fact that they're not as smart as you think they are. Somebody told you that they're so much smarter than you, that they're so much more industrious than you. We are the pyramid builders. 
they built that uh that little thing in in Europe. I forgot what they call it, where they just got them them, them five or six uh, uh uh pieces of stone just stitched stone hinge. That's what they built. That's the best they can do is take a big boulder and just sit it upright. We built the pyramids, so they're getting to the point where they're so vexed. By the God, by Master Father Muhammad, by the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and what they're doing with the weather, that the day is going to come where they just going to clock out. They're going to Fred Flintstone out on this. They, they, they are Fred Flintstone after after all. They are the caveman of this world, the only caveman. They're going to clock out on us. What are we going to do then? In fact, I use that as a segue or an excuse to show you this. This is a brother in North Carolina. I believe the brother's name is Rodney. I could be wrong about that, but even if I got that wrong, I'm going to get the brother's company right. Power X Generators. You can go to PowerXGenerator.com. But this is just to show you the kind of talent that we have in the nation that's operating right now. He has a line of small-scale and large-scale electric generators that can power a football stadium or a tent, depending on what your needs are. And the time is going to come where we're going to have to depend on brothers like this in order to provide something as the infrastructure, something like, you know, something as, as basic and as needed and as necessary as electricity. They say we offer a full line of products for all of your alternative power needs. Our traditional units are built with quality and innovation. Additionally, our PowerX Lithium line offers longer running time and recovery. I intend to buy one of our brother's uh, generators very soon because we are all, <laughs> you know, I used to live in a place where they called it Tornado Alley, but we are all in the way of destruction if we're standing next to this open enemy. That's all Master Father Muhammad is waiting on is for us to get out the way. So we may find ourselves in the middle of a disaster. And here we are leaning on the Caucasian like a child leans on their parents for them to give us the basic necessities, a roof over our head and electricity. The time is going to come when they're going to clock out of that position. And we're going to have to do for, we're going to have to do it for self ain't just going to be a topic on nation town. It's going to be what you have to do. But. The good news is we got brothers who can actually provide that kind of service. Now, let's, we're going to deal with a couple more. Well, actually, one more. I got to show this. We talked about construction. We talked about urban renewal. Let's talk about farming. This was a brother who was just looking for a house for his family. He, he had his mind set on one acre of land. He came, he continued to look, continued to look, continued to look because he had the desire. There go that desire again, feeding the wheel. And he actually came upon a farm that was for sale that was within his price range. And it, I believe it was 22 acres. And here's the beauty. Here's what I love about this. Not only did he buy this farm and it was, it was already producing crops, already producing a harvest without even his own effort. He didn't even know that these crops were being produced on this farm. But the beauty of it is that once he realized that they were producing this, he just spread the word amongst the believers and other believers began to come to the area and then also buy property within the same area. So we don't have to come together and wait for some organized effort. Just start a beachhead. You be the first one to go out and do something. And that synergy and that centripetal and centrifugal force will bring others. Let's check it out.
all praises are due to Allah. And and that was the brother who just he 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 really just fell into this because he had the desire to buy a home for his family that was outside of the city, away from the muck and the mire that we run into so much in the urban areas. And he ran into a beautiful opportunity that he's passed on to his family. Again, we're not talking about a rich brother. We're not talking about a, a brother who come from a silver spoon. We're not talking about a family who's got all these extra advantages and stuff. No, they just had the desire. Last but not least, I want you to hear again from my brother, Abdul Akbar. That was the brother who did the, uh, the urban renewal. Listen to what he has to say. He's going to give us a little insight to some of the obstacles that he's had in trying to rebuild the wasted cities. But listen closely to what our brother said. Would love to be able to share in to a vision of what it means to build a community. We could be able to deal with the science of business because that's what it is that we have been missing. The science of business. And what is business? It's warfare. Business is warfare. One example that I won't be long. When I bought the mall over there on 71st in Yates, I bought it from an Arab. They call him the king of Arabs in Chicago, Musa Tadros. He said to me, do you know what I got this mall for? I said, no, Musa, I don't know what you got it for. My business is laundry. They had a vacant laundromat there that was closed down. He said, I stole it from one of your people, Vernon Caldwell. He said, I bet you if you had had knowledge of this, that he was in trouble in this situation, you probably would have pulled the things together amongst your people. I said, well, so what you buy it for? He said, $300,000. I said, 300? How could he lose it like that? I took that one liberty to talk to another Jewish guy at another mall that I'm a sharecropper in because it's important to own the land, not just be a sharecropper to deal with a landlord. So I went to the Jewish guy. I got a 20 year lease. I'm an anchor tenant there paying 20,000 a month for two businesses in that mall. And I said, Mr. Munch, you own the state of Illinois building. You own buildings all throughout Hyde Park and all throughout the city of Chicago, you build Walmarts. I said, I'd love to be able to buy this shopping mall for you, from you. He says, why do you want to buy it? I said, why wouldn't I want to buy it? I'm the anchor tenant here. He said, you need to get this out of your mind. Get it out of your mind. This was built and made and it's for my children. Set it up for my children. So I've been able to take that cash cow to begin to buy properties that I own the land. Properties in Lincoln Highway, I'll buy uh, the south suburbs, building and owning the land. Properties in Woodlawn and not letting him know what I'm doing. Because when I begin to expose what I'm doing, I don't think that I would have that good energy. I think there would be certain roadblocks in the way. So I said all of that to say, brothers and sisters, we have to begin to do something for ourselves. This is our time. During this pandemic, money is out there. It ain't about access to capital because we already have capital as the biggest consumer that exists. We have been the biggest consumer. We got the money. We just need to be able to pool our resources together and begin to do something. Praises due to a lot. And before we close out, I want to go over some because one thing I kept, if you notice, the whole time the plenary session was going on, it was interactive. So people could, you know, could type comments just like we're doing right now on Nation Town TV Live. But one question I kept seeing pop up is a couple of sisters were asking the question. I guess they thought they would take questions from the comment section. Uh, I don't know if they intended to or not. But they were asking the question, what's the first steps we should take? 
to follow the example of our brothers and sisters. And what, I, what I've shown you is just a couple of the examples. They also went over uh, police uh, uh, operations. They went over, um, there was a brother, sister, brother Shahid, otherwise known as the math doctor, him and his lovely wife, who we're going to hear from before we get up out of here. Uh, they also uh, are starting a boarding school outside of the Chicago area. But one thing I want to point out, for those who might have that question of what, how to start, how do you get the process of, of separation going? Do you have to be rich? Do you have to have this? Do you have to have that? Do you need 100,000 people behind you? Whatever the case may be. Well, listen, at some point you have to do something unless, unless, unless you're a house Negro. Not just a house Negro, but a neo house nigga. What is a neo house nigga? You know, them one of them nation town words. The neo house nigga. Now, before we get into the neo house nigga, well, let me just tell you what a neo. A neo house nigga is somebody, it's like the brother said, he's a he's a he's an idler. He's somebody, he or she is somebody that does not do nothing. They like living in the house with their master. They like their current situation. They like being shot down in the streets either by the enemy or by another black person with the enemy's mind. They like spending 98% of their money with their enemy. They like the world as it is, and they don't want any change. So they're a neo-house nigga. Now, I want to correct one of, the things that was, one of the things that was clear about our brother Malcolm X was that once he reached a certain point under the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he began to kind of infuse some of his own thoughts into what he taught the people because he was, he famously said something that I'm almost certain was not the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And a lot of us take it as such, but it was and actually what he said was actually incorrect. Many of you may remember that Malcolm always taught about the dichotomy between the house Negro and the slave Negro. And that sounds good. And what he's trying to say in that makes sense, but it is historically inaccurate. It's just not accurate because what he puts out there is that you had the house Negro and you had the field Negro and the field Negro was the revolutionary. They're the ones that didn't like massa. They were the ones who, who worked the hardest and, and that, that's debatable. But the idea that the house Negro, those that worked in the house were all pushovers and were all sellouts and all coons was absolutely not a fact. But we're not just going to drop that on your head. We're going to come with facts. First of all, Sojourner Truth. You might have heard of her. Very well-known abolitionist. Not only was she a slave, but she was a slave in the North. So that's one common misconception is that they didn't have slavery in the North. But she worked in the house. She was a wet nurse. She helped with the babies, with the masses babies and with the madam, as they used to call them. She worked in the house. Nat Turner started off in the field as a child, but once his intellect was noticed and his ability to teach and preach out of the Bible, he was taken out of the field and was tutored in the house. And he, Nat Turner, Mr. Mr. Cutter Cracker's head off, was a house Negro. He was a house slave, but not a house Negro. Sojourner Truth was a house slave, but not a house Negro. And then you had Frederick Douglass, who also escaped from slavery. But when he was in slavery, he was in the house. He was a house slave, but not a house Negro. And this sister right here, who they're trying to put on your $20 bill, Harriet Tubman, she also worked in the house. She was not in the field. So Brother Malcolm uh, was actually erroneous in teaching that idea that everybody that was in the house was a sellout and everybody in the field was some kind of revolutionary. They had coons in the field and they had revolutionaries in the house. And these are just some examples that proves that. However, a neo house nigga, remember, they were all house slaves, but they were not house niggas. Nat Turner was not a house nigga. He was a house slave. But the neo house nigga is one who does not want to separate, who likes it the way it is. They look around and say, what, <laughs> what better could I have it than the way I have it here? You like the way things are. For you, 
this ain't for you. Nation Town ain't for you. You know, do your thing. Have fun. You know, good luck and Godspeed. But for those who are not Neo House Negroes, we're going to go over a few quick steps. And I'm not going to give you what my opinion is. We're going to go right back in that black man's Bible again. Message to the black man. In fact, to be specific, page 203. Where if you read it carefully, it breaks down three very succinct steps. And, they, and, they, and the message gives it to you in order. The top three steps in order to go forward with turning what you saw today from an example into execution. Let's get it started. Let's start with the first one. Now, first and foremost, this is page 203 in Message to the Black Man. And I have circled those top three steps. But let's look closer. Step number one, it has to be mental. Separation got to be mental. You got to want it. And you can't just kind of want it. Like you kind of got a taste for some ice cream. You kind of got a taste for some for some buffalo wings. You kind of got a taste for a beep. No, 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 no. It's got to be something that you understand the necessity and the urgency of. So it's got to be the mental aspect of it. You got to really desire it and want it. So the messenger says with the right understanding and with business unity, we can turn the great flow of millions of dollars that we leave, that leave black communities and go into the hands of white businessmen back into our own pockets of the poor black men and women. So that's step number one. It's got to be mental. You got to have an understanding of the need and the necessity of separation. Number two, the messenger says, well, first, we must stop being so foolish as to spend our few hard earned dollars with the rich of this land. So the second step is economics. Economics. Economics has a Greek root in a word called oikonomias or oikonomios. And in that root, economics talks about the science of buying and selling. It's the science of consumption. It also deals with thrift. You've heard the minister say that God himself is the most economic force in creation because he does not waste anything. How wasteful are we? First of all, we're wasteful because there's actually no shortage of black owned businesses. There are plenty of black owned businesses. But do we support them? And how else do you expect these businesses to grow? You want perfect customer service. But are you giving them enough money so they can train their employees and pay them more so they can care more about their job? You want a perfect selection of products, but are you paying them more so they can go out and source those products? So economics is number two, but let's go deeper into that word economics. Nearly every economist has at some point in the standard coursework been exposed to a brief explanation that the origin of the word economy can be traced back to the Greek word oikonomia which in turn is composed of two words, oikos, which is usually translated as household. Hmm, there go that word, household. And nemian, which is best translated as management and dispensation. How well are we managing the money in our household? And I don't just mean budgeting, but budgeting with separation in mind. Again, if you're spending more than 80% of your money with your enemy. Take that Black Lives Matter shirt off. Take the bow tie off. Take the headpiece off. Take the, the leather jacket and the, and, the, and, the, and the beret off. Put all that up. If you went, and went off and bought a bunch of guns because you think that's going to be your salvation, give all them guns away. You're wasting your time. What are you protecting? You're not protecting nothing. Because it takes the lifeblood of any society is its economy. So even if you go start a wonderfully successful business and every profit that you make off of it, you give it right back to your enemy. You essentially have the same function of a slave. You go out there in the field, you, 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 you pull and harvest the crop and you bring it back to massa. See, things change when you start bringing that crop and that harvest back to yourself and to your own. Now, last but not least, the third step is land. 
land. We must have some of the earth to produce our people's needs. Now, keep in mind, we have to do all three of these things to successfully separate. And they must be done in this order. And you can't skip steps. You can't have the economics without the mental side because your money is just going to go out the window. You can't have the knowledge of the need of separation, but you still spend the 98 percent of your money with your enemy. You're, you're, you're looking to rent instead of own. So you can have the knowledge and talk the knowledge, but if you're not making a concerted effort for the other two, you're wasting your time. And you can go and buy land. There are a lot of black people who own land, but they seek to buy land amongst their enemies. They seek to buy land just so they can be accepted with their enemies. That's not separation. That's the most virulent form of integration, to be honest. So those are the first three steps that you got to take. And these are three steps that you can take right now. You don't have to kick that can down the road. And last but not least, I want to hear from uh, the wife of our dear brother, the math doctor, Brother Shahid, because she said something in that same sentence. The problem that I'm seeing is we're not realizing everything we need is right in our nation. We have everything that we need to tell this devil we are going for self. So this Savior's Day and this pandemic has been a blessing because it is forcing us to come together. And we have so much beauty and talent amongst ourselves. What are we waiting for? This is our time. The brother said it. Our time is now. So I'm like a family. I was on mute when I gave the last greetings. I want to I wanna definitely make up for that. I'm going to leave y'all as I greeted y'all in the words of peace of Ice Salam Alaikum. Was told to deliver this message.